the presentation that Fernanda is having me show you now is one that I created uh, a few weeks ago for um, sort of a strange speaking tour that I did in Durango, Colorado. And I was coming down there, I was going down there to speak to the Green Business Roundtable and people who were not very versed in currencies. So there's one level that we can talk about things on um, this presentation that doesn't go very deep into the currencies, but we can also go a little bit deeper, which I think may be important for this group. Um, and some of the tools are, are here to help us go deeper, but um, it's good for me to know <laughs> how deep to go. <laughs> so um, I'm just going to go ahead and start. And what uh, just to give a disclaimer that I, I'm sort of using some kind of light-hearted examples um, to try to um, illustrate some of the the depth of value that is currently missing, like we don't have access to in our current economy, and that I believe that we're actually moving toward being able to have a much deeper relationship to value and wealth, and in part that relationship is enabled through new currencies. Um, so I'm just going to step forward and start off by meeting Bessie. She is a, a cow, uh, a dairy cow born nearby here uh, to one of the farms, and um, she's uh, a Holstein breed of cow, and um, that's a, a special, specially bred dairy cow, and the, she's been raised with, uh, by one of the children here, Annie, who has just grown up with her and loves Bessie, has a whole relationship to Bessie as her favorite cow, and she also entered Bessie in the 4-H club um, some competitions and Bessie won first place for sweetest milk and uh, nicely Bessie is also grass fed and uh, organic growth hormone free her milk is uh, growth hormone free um, and if eaten without growth hormones she produces about 11.3 gallons a day of 3.7% butter fat which given the current wholesale pricing for milk yields $7,754.06 a year. So you can see how there's one way of thinking about this. Where these are different levels of measurement for a cow. They're all in some ways referencing parts of the value of Bessie, but at very different levels. And in particular, different levels of system integrity. So there's the relationship between systems, like the breed of cow, and even the name Bessie, is describing the whole the whole cow, right? And then sweetest milk, um, we're able to kind of measure that performance relative to other cows, and then other characteristics characteristics of Bessie, like having organic milk, not being fed growth hormones, being grass-fed, that, that kind of thing, and the product that, able, that Bessie is able to produce. And finally, the market price that we're able to get for the value extracted through those products. These are all very different levels of a system. I'm going to pause here for one moment and go a little bit deeper thinking about this is not something that I did at the Green Business Roundtable, but if we think about humans, if we think about us as people, we have the kinds of characteristics too. If we start at um, the very, um, where all the dollar signs are, right? If I were to relate to any of you as for example, the plasma and platelets that I could extract from you um, and sell on the open market, right? The plasma extraction, if I can extract, you know, 1.3 liters of plasma a month from you, you know, that would be like how much milk Bessie is producing. And then there's the market price that I could get for that plasma. But then there's like your blood type or antibodies that are in your blood that are characteristics 
right? And there's there's your health, your blood pressure and your your overall health, which is to deal with the performance of you as a system. And then you as as Ben or Sherry or Camilo as you know, that there's you as a whole system and the relationships that you have with other systems. And you can see how if we move everything toward measurements of what wealth we can extract from you to be able to trade, it misses most of the wealth that you are. And unfortunately, our whole economy at the moment is oriented around that extracting of value. So why do we care about the levels of system integrity? Why do we care about system integrity? Because our failure to manage it is causing us a lot of problems right now. Um, again, this was made for a green business roundtable, so I was actually speaking to people in the sustainability movement. And the good news is the economy that we're transitioning into is about creating and recognizing more value at all of these levels. So let's take a look at what we currently measure and recognize as value. You know, we have these charts of accounts and dollar values in these charts of accounts and, you know, we can measure the performance of a business and, you know, of an economy and the gross domestic product and all of these different things in these terms. And as accountants will tell you, anything that we can't measure in those terms, we have a nice little term for those. They're called intangibles, right? The goodwill of the community towards your company. This stuff is just intangible. The real tangibles are these things we can extract and sell. Except, if you think about it, that means they're calling these things intangible, like the quality of your product and the ability for you to produce results and your relationships with employees and, and vendors and having a team that can actually work together, the trust in the brand, your relationships with customers, your ability to adapt, all that kind of stuff. There's something wrong with that picture. They're completely missing all of what it takes to produce the things that they're calling tangible, the, the things that they're calling tangible. It's like they've gotten something upside down they've actually mistaken <laughs> the products, the byproducts of a system with the value that it takes, the value that's embedded in that system that makes it able to produce those byproducts. So this is obviously a picture of an iceberg, and the products are really just kind of the tip of the iceberg. And even less tangible than the tip of the iceberg, less substantial than that, is then the market price which, you know, obviously the market price for Bessie's milk has very little to do with Bessie. It's about a different system altogether. And it's like we've lost the relationship to what it is that produces the value, where it is that value actually emerges from. It kind of reminds me of the, uh, the story of the, the goose that lays the golden eggs and, of course, the outcome of that story when they get greedy and try to uh, get to the gold faster is they kill the goose. And this is the kind of problem that we're experiencing right now when we have this extractive relationship to everything. It turns out we're killing everything <laughs> because we aren't able to, to measure, appreciate, and make tangible the value at all of these other levels. So let's look at another example. Consider a beehive. And um, I'm, I'm sure that most of you have heard about colony collapse. And one of the cool things about colony collapse is it's raised people's awareness of the role of bees in the ecosystem. Because you had people that were saying, well, what's the big deal if there's, you know, so we have a little bit less honey, right? <laughs> but obviously the whole point is that bees are in relationship to the whole food system with the, cross, with the pollination that they do. So the performance that they're engaged in at the performance level, right, is in pollinating flowers, which is where we get most of our fruits and vegetables and all that kind of stuff. And out of that, you can have, you know, uh, clover honey or you can have, you know, you can have healthy beehive that emerges from this activity 
and it is able to actually produce a byproduct of honey, which then could be sold. But obviously the importance of what it can be sold for is negligible compared to the whole food system, right? That's, it's a much smaller part of the picture. It's an almost tangential part of the picture. And the strange kind of poverty that we live in right now <laughs> has to do with being so preoccupied with only that layer of value is part of what makes us miss out on all of the deeper levels of value. And it has us think that business is about making money, which is like thinking that bees are for making honey. You really actually start to miss the real value that a business is for, is for the value, the impact that they have in their community. And if there's a byproduct of profit for shareholders, that's really kind of a minor side effect. It really isn't where the deeper value lies. Now, the good news is that most people on some level already know this about their business, if they're a business person. And if you're not, you also probably still know this. But our attention keeps getting pulled back to money because of how upside down we've gotten things and how much we think we need this artificially scarce thing to get access to things around us, the value from other people. But the good news is that things are, are turning around again and we're remembering what matters. So how does this all relate? Do you remember when food was just food, not all natural, organic, locally goat grown, fair trade, non-GMO, free range, grass fed, you know, <laughs> all that type of stuff. What is happening with these things is they are actually currencies. They are currencies that are beginning to, to try to make visible value at those layers of the iceberg under the water. Right? It's not just food. It's food that was grown a particular way, that doesn't have poisons, that, you know, all of these kinds of things that we are now making visible and that people are shifting their buying habits and shifting their relationships to these things because we're now making those other levels of value visible. Yes, those things that I'm calling currencies are not tradable currencies. They're not like money. And that's part of what it means to be in the midst of an economic revolution. What I mean by an economic revolution is just like we move from hunter-gatherer societies, what I would call natural economies, into agricultural age economies, into industrial age economies. We are in the midst right now of moving into information age economies. And in every time one of these shifts occur, the rules change drastically. If you don't learn the new rules, then you get stuck trying to do the, the same things for the old model and get left behind. So the first rule is that money is information. This is actually not a new rule. <laughs> it actually always has been. It's a symbol. It's not the thing that happens to have the symbols printed on it. Even when the, the, we had coins made of precious metal, you know, what made it a coin was that it was minted with particular symbols. Otherwise, it would have just been a chunk of metal. And in other, in other words, trading a commodity. And you can certainly trade commodities and barter between those things, but what makes money money is that it's a symbol. But currencies aren't just money. Currencies are symbol systems, just like money is, but, but we use to make currents visible. So when I said organic, free range, non-GMO, those kinds of things were currencies, there's a certification process of how you can get the organic label and you actually have to, you know... Andrew has left the conference. You actually have to be operating at particular standards and, and that kind of thing to get the organic label. Um, so we use these kinds of things to make currents visible, which is why I'm using the word currencies, even though normally we, we use the word currency sort of interchangeably with money. Um, but here's the, 
the other really good news is that deep value is not tradable. Deep and real value can't be extracted to trade. It's actually embedded in the, those deeper levels of the system, and you don't want to try to extract it. But it doesn't mean that we can't use currencies to get, get access to some of these other levels of value. So going back to the diagram we started with with Bessie and the different levels, you can see that these are actually different levels of wealth and different ways that we use to measure and give access to these levels of wealth. So there's acknowledgeable, nameable wealth used that we can, we can actually access through nominal metrics, rankable wealth, measurable, tradable wealth. All of our economies so far, <laughs> all of our economic models have been embedded at the, the level of tradable wealth. They haven't expanded out to these other domains, and that's kind of the, the breakthrough that we're having now is being able to experience wealth and access wealth at these other levels and stop having just an extractive relationship to it because when we measure everything in terms of tradability, we actually measure everything, we value everything in terms of what we can extract and transfer ownership of. Um, so by connecting that to Bessie again, you can kind of see the relationship between these things. I'm going to pause for a moment to look at that. So let me give some other examples. So um, Olympic gold medals, for example, are at the level of sweetest milk, right, first place, they're rankable wealth. They're, compare, they're actually tapping into the performance level of a system. When you want to see how an athlete can perform, you, you actually have them perform against another athlete <laughs> because their performance it can be affected real time. Would they have run that mile in 3 minutes and 48 seconds if there wasn't somebody right on their heels at three minutes and fifty seconds, you know, um, it it actually <laughs> is the way, the appropriate way to compare at that level. And we already know this in certain ways, right? That we we have Olympic gold medals because we are able to to do comparisons at that level. We're able to do to use currencies at each of these levels, but we have become preoccupied with the currencies in the tradable and speculative domains, uh, which are rational numbers. <laughs> Sorry, I want to give one other example. And I chose not to use this example in the, um, the presentation because the guidelines for the presentation was that it was supposed to actually be somewhat inspiring, leave people with a positive message. And at first, I was going to use examples of two cows, Bessie and Bucky. And Bucky is a steer who is being raised for, you know, a 4-H contest who then, of course, gets slaughtered at the end. And his tradable wealth is not, you know, gallons of milk, but 715.3 pounds of beef, <laughs> right? And you can see how that divisible level, like you can divide up pounds of beef, but you can't divide up cows and still have cows. And so we have a problem if we manage everything from the rational numbers at the level of, of you know, divisible currencies when we, because we translate that back upward into how we manage everything else because we steer our businesses and organizations by those numbers which creates an extractive relationship and also has us have problems managing the system integrity at these other levels where you can't divide up a cow and still have a cow, for example. Um, so what now? What do we do about this? My suggestion is that you look at your business or you look at your community and look at what some of the deep value is that you want to make available to people, that you want to make invisible, that you want to provide access to. Not to trade, but to deepen people's experience and relationship to, to things. And then design appropriate currencies to make that value visible. 
So there's uh, a little bit of resources at this uh, at this website for this kind of thing.